In this video, we're going to cover the contribution margin income statement and compare it to a gap, meaning generally accepted accounting principles, income statement. What is cost volume profit analysis? Cost volume profit analysis, or CVP for short, is a tool used by management for decision making. It's used to determine the volume of sales necessary to cover all of the organization's costs and to earn a profit. In addition, because business conditions are always changing, CVP analysis is used by management to prepare for and respond to economic changes. What changes am I referring to? Changes in the variables used to calculate CVP analysis. Changes which cause operating income to also change. These changes include such things as the number of units sold from period to period the selling price being charged per unit to the customer, the variable cost per unit, such as the cost of materials or labor, the total amount of fixed costs, such as the monthly costs for rent or depreciation, and the sales mix. Sales mix is the combination of products that make up total sales. For example, 70% of a company's sales may be made up of lawnmower sales and 30% replacement blades. Sales mix is the term used with regards to the percentage of total sales that each product represents. By understanding the interrelationship of these factors, management is able to make better decision with regards to future uncertainties. They can use this information to better understand what might happen in the future. What assumptions underlie CVP analysis? There are a number of critical assumptions that must be understood. First, the behavior of both costs and revenues is linear within the relevant range. This means that the per unit costs and revenues do not fluctuate and the relationship between costs and revenues stays constant. All costs can be classified as either fixed or variable. This is important because some variable costs can be fixed and some fixed costs can vary with the level of activity. For example, Direct labor is treated as variable, but often when individuals are paid a salary, direct labor is actually fixed. However, in CVP analysis, we assume that direct labor is variable and that all fixed costs are fixed within the relevant range. Changes in volume are the only factor that affect costs. Inventory levels remain constant and that all units produced are sold. We know that companies generally retain some level of finished goods inventory to ensure appropriate stock is available for customer orders. However, for the purpose of CVP analysis, we assume 100% of the units being produced are also sold. When more than one type of product is sold, the sales mix remains constant. Remember the 70-40 split between the lawnmowers and replacement blades? That mix is assumed to be constant over time. All of these assumptions are necessary to perform CVP analysis. When these assumptions are not valid, CVP analysis may result in inaccurate information. Does that mean that CVP analysis is without value? Absolutely not. Any prediction with regards to the future is just that, a prediction, really an educated guess. CVP analysis can help management to plan for future uncertainties, but no prediction with regards to the future is ever perfect. Understanding the limitations of CVP analysis allows us to use it appropriately for decision making. Because of the importance of CVP analysis with regards to decision making, management prefers that their income statement be presented as a CVP income statement, more commonly called the contribution margin income statement. What does this mean? The easiest way to understand this is if we first produce a standard GAP, generally accepted accounting principles, income statement. We can then use the same information to produce a contribution margin income statement and then compare the two. We'll do this through an example. David Inc. has the following information available for their product XD2 for the month of November. Units sold, 2000. Selling price per unit, 1100 We then have all the following per unit variable costs. Direct material of $400, direct labor of $200, 
sales commission of $30, and administrative expenses of $100. The total variable cost per unit is therefore equal to $730. Next are listed the monthly fixed costs as follows. Manufacturing overhead of $86,000, sales costs of $21,500, and administrative costs of $322,500. Total monthly fixed costs are $430. Let's use this information to produce a standard GAP, generally accepted accounting principles, income statement, similar to what you would have done in introductory financial accounting. In order to do that, we first have to determine the total sales revenue and the total variable costs. Units sold are 2000 and if we multiply the units sold by the per unit selling price and then by each of the per unit variable costs, we will obtain the total sales revenue and the total variable costs for the month of November. Per unit selling price is $1,100 multiplied by 2,000 units is equal to 2,200,000, which is the total sales revenue. Per unit direct materials of $400 multiplied by 2,000 units is equal to $800,000 for total direct materials. Per unit direct labor is $200 multiplied by 2,000 units is equal to $400,000 of total direct labor. Sales commission of $30 per unit multiplied by 2,000 units is equal to $60,000 for total sales commission. And administrative expenses per unit of $100 multiplied by 2,000 units is equal to $200,000 of total administrative expenses. The monthly fixed costs are always provided as total for the period, so no calculation is required. We now have all the necessary information to complete our standard GAAP income statement. We'll start our income statement with the company name, David Inc., followed by the name of the statement, which in this case is GAAP income statement, and then the date, month ended November 30th, 2000X6. Sales revenue is $2,200,000. Next, the heading cost of goods sold, followed by all of the manufacturing costs, starting with direct materials of $800,000, then direct labor of $400,000, and finally manufacturing overhead of $86,000. This results in a total cost of goods sold of $1,286,000. We can now calculate gross profit, which is the sales revenue of $2,200,000 minus the cost of goods sold of $1,286,000 for a gross profit of $914,000. Next, we list our period costs with the heading operating expenses. Sales commission of 60,000, administrative expenses of 200,000, sales costs of 21,500, and administrative costs of $322,500. Total operating expenses is $604,000. This results in an operating income of $310,000, which is calculated as gross profit of $914,000 less total operating expenses of $604,000. You can see that the GAAP income statement lists product costs separately from period costs. The product costs are listed as part of cost of goods sold, but the period costs are listed as operating expenses. The focus of the GAAP income statement is gross profit, sometimes called gross margin which is the difference between the sales revenue and the cost of goods sold. The users of financial statements often use both the gross profit and the gross profit percentage in order to analyze the income statement. The gross profit percentage is calculated as gross profit divided by sales revenue. In this case, the gross profit percentage would be $914,000 divided by $2,200,000 multiplied by 100%, which rounded equals 42%. Note that the gross profit percentage is identical if calculated on a per unit basis. This is a GAAP income statement and, as I noted previously, you would have covered this income statement in introductory financial accounting. Now, how does a contribution margin income statement differ from a GAAP income statement? Let's go back to the base information from David Inc. We're now going to use the same information and prepare a contribution margin income statement. Remember, this is also called a CVP income statement. The contribution margin income statement groups costs into variable and fixed costs. This is in order to calculate contribution margin. The variable and fixed costs are already separated in this example, so we'll jump directly to the contribution margin income statement. We start the same way as the GAAP income statement. 
the company name, David Inc., the name of the statement, which in this case is the contribution margin income statement, also called the CVP income statement, and the date, month ended November 30th, 2000X6. The first line item is identical for both statements, sales revenue of $2,200,000. Next, the heading variable costs, followed by all of the variable costs which are incurred during the production and sale of the products. This includes direct materials of $800,000, direct labor of $400,000, sales commission of $60,000, and administrative expenses of $200,000. All of these costs are variable because they change with the level of activity, which in this case is the number of units sold. Total variable costs are equal to $1,460,000. We then deduct the total variable costs from the sales revenue to determine the contribution margin. $2,200,000 minus $1,460,000 is equal to a contribution margin of $740,000. What does contribution margin mean? It's the amount of income which is available to cover the fixed costs and the profit for the owners of the company. That's why it's called the contribution margin, because it contributes to the ability of the company to pay their fixed costs and create a profit for the shareholders. Note that this is the total contribution margin, but we can calculate the per unit contribution margin by dividing the total contribution margin of $740,000 by the number of units sold, which in this case is 2,000 units. Moving forward with the statement, we then have the heading fixed costs, followed by a listing of the fixed costs. Manufacturing overhead of $86,000, sales costs of $21,500, and administrative costs of $322,500. Total fixed costs are equal to $430,000. We can now calculate the operating income. Contribution margin of $740,000 minus total fixed costs of $430,000 is equal to the operating income of $310,000. Did you notice something important? The contribution margin income statement lists variable costs separately from fixed costs and totally ignores the categorization of product and period costs. You can see that some of the period costs are variable and they are therefore categorized with all the other variable costs. Some of the product costs are fixed and they are therefore categorized as fixed costs. There is no separation or categorization of product and period costs when we produce the contribution margin income statement. Instead, we only divide costs into variable and fixed categories. You can also see that the operating income under the gap income statement and the contribution margin income statement are identical. The contribution margin income statement simply changes the way we group costs. Under the gap income statement, we group costs by product and period costs. However, under the contribution margin income statement, we group costs by variable and fixed. This is because of cost behavior. Variable costs change with the level of activity, but fixed costs remain constant. In order to understand how operating income will change if there are changes in the level of activity, it's critical that we separate our costs into variable and fixed, and that's exactly what the contribution margin income statement does. What else can we calculate with the contribution margin income statement? we can calculate the contribution margin ratio. There are two methods to calculate this, either using totals or per unit information. Let's calculate with totals first. Total contribution margin divided by the total sales revenue multiplied by 100% is equal to the contribution margin ratio. In this case, $740,000 divided by $2,200,000 multiplied by 100% is equal to 34%. Well, it actually equals 33.6364%, but I've rounded it to 34%. That is the contribution margin ratio. What does it mean? It means that for every $1 of sales revenue, the company earns 34 cents of income, which can be used to cover fixed costs and to create a profit for the shareholders. So, 34% of every dollar will contribute to covering the fixed costs and the profit. We can also calculate the contribution margin ratio on a per unit basis. Recall that the unit selling price is $1,100. The total unit variable costs are $730. 
Therefore, the contribution margin per unit is equal to $1,100 sales revenue minus $730 variable cost, which is $370. That's the per unit contribution margin. Note that the unit contribution margin tells manager how much profit they make on each unit before considering fixed costs. Using this per unit contribution margin, we can now calculate the contribution margin ratio again. In this case, the formula is contribution margin per unit divided by the selling price per unit multiplied by 100%. $370 divided by $1,100 multiplied by 100% is equal to 34% rounded. Note that it is identical to the contribution margin ratio that we calculated using the totals for both the contribution margin and sales revenue. Using the contribution margin income statement, we can also calculate the variable cost ratio, either in total or per unit. If we calculate the variable cost ratio in total, we would take the total variable costs divided by the total sales revenue multiplied by 100%. Therefore, total variable costs of 1,460,000 divided by total sales revenue of 2,200,000 multiplied by 100% is equal to 66%. Rounded, of course. We can also do this on a per unit basis. Total unit variable costs of $730 divided by the unit selling price of $1,100 multiplied by 100% is still equal to 66%. Rounded. Notice something interesting? We know that sales revenue is equal to 100% because 2,200,000 divided by 2,200,000 multiplied by 100% is equal to 100%. And Per unit sales revenue of 1,100 divided by per unit sales revenue of 1,100 is also equal to 100%. We can now see that there is a relationship between the variable cost ratio and the contribution margin ratio. If we take the 100% of the sales revenue and deduct the 34% of the contribution margin ratio, we get the variable cost ratio of 66%. If we take the sales revenue of 100% and deduct the variable cost ratio of 66%, we get the contribution margin ratio of 34%. Therefore, if a question provides you with either the variable cost ratio or the contribution margin ratio, you can always calculate the other. For instance, if you're given a contribution margin ratio of 28% and nothing else, then you can calculate the variable cost ratio as 100% minus 28%, which equals a variable cost ratio of 72%. Understanding this relationship is key to understanding CVP analysis. Note that the contribution margin income statement is the one most commonly used in managerial accounting, and we will continue to use it moving forward. It's critical that you gain a firm understanding of the format of a contribution margin income statement also called a CVP income statement. This, of course, requires practice. As always, thanks so much for watching.